you are using this term post fordism one of the first uh, sociologists observing this phenomenon, this transition from Fordism to post fordism yes, yes. Daniel Bell. Uh, he was welcoming this process with uh, a kind of uh, fear. Uh, he feared that the new culture, this hedonistic culture, changing the old Fordistic world, Protestant values, you know, that this hedonistic uh, culture coming instead of a Fordism would uh, destroy capitalism mm -hmm. or something. That it is a, an ethic of rationalism on the fundaments of... He was scared. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now, after your lecture, I can see that all these hedonists, of whom Daniel Bell was so scared about, turned into pretty good slaves of the system. Yeah. <laughs> How it was possible? Okay, this, uh, this is a serious thing. I think, first of all, uh, to get a little bit back, uh, post Fordism is an economy of ideas. And when uh, ideas are capitalized or uh, are in function, we all know ideas are in your head. So it is a very uh, double thing. Uh, capitalism can try to capitalize your ideas and it develops a lot of strategies in post fordism But at the other side, because you, uh, at this moment you still not can implug in your brains, you can't see what somebody is doing, so you can still free use your ideas. So there is a very double way and a very double strategy you can use. And um, Antonio Negri and uh, Michael Hart uh, um, make a, um, a differentiation between two concepts which was uh, introduced by Michel Foucault, biopolitics. And they say it's not only about biopolitics, you have biopower. Biopower is a way to try to catch and capitalize your ideas and, and develop strategies to do this, for example, um, a very evident strategy is to measure your time on the computer when you do immature labor that's, uh, that you can be controlled from some other places. This is a way of uh, biopower. What means biopower? Trying to control life itself. Bios stands for life. Uh, what Negri and Hart say, you can also defend by what they call biopolitics. Not biopo and biopolitics is, for example, using your ideas to do other things. And because your employer still can't see what you are thinking, you can do completely other things than, uh, or think completely other things than you are explaining at, work, uh, at the shop floor. So there is a kind of double thing in post fordism in which you can build up also resistance. First, on the individual level, it's very individual, it's your ideas. And you can say, for example, you can say a form of individual resistance is, for example, you can say to the employer, um, I think this is a good idea, this is a good idea, for example, for a commercial or something like, let's say this is the context. But what you can do as an individual say, I only tell them half good ideas. I keep the good ideas for myself to do something else when I have the money, for example, to make my own company, etc. This is a form of playing with ideas and a form of also you can use those ideas also to make autonomous artwork, for example, etc. So this is an individual level of resistance of bio uh, politics. But on the collective uh, level now, I think more and more uh, designers, for example, etc., can develop also on a collective uh, level strategies to um, use their ideas in another way. And I think maybe it's a blunt example, but uh, uh, Occupy is maybe a way to let's see that you can do something else with your time uh, and you can still go to work and at the other side uh, do something political, uh, things, etc. Et uh, you are talking about resistance, <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, to resist uh, against this new kind of control, this biopolitical mm -hmm. control, but in the, na in the name of what? In, in the name of what we should resist? Because even such terms like authenticity or freedom, <laughs> mm -hmm. as you were putting, are colonized by yeah, the market. Totally, you're right. Uh, but of course, it's um, 
uh, it's even promoted, eh? you have to be authentic, <laughs> first of all. Uh, the freedom that is promoted in this, in this neoliberal or post fordist system on the shop floor is of course a fake freedom. It's a freedom that is uh, uh, measurable and uh, which is under control. It is uh, freedom without risks. For me this is uh, the difference between liberalism and uh, neoliberalism. The, neo uh, the liberalism uh, of the 19th century uh, standard for the ideology of freedom, liberal, uh, but it also believed when you let people, entrepreneurs, but also artists free, it's the best you can do to get a better uh, society. That is liberalism about in, in the uh, idealistic, uh, in the best sense. Hmm? Neoliberalism doesn't trust anymore the freedom of the individual and tries to organize it, tries to catch it uh, in a way. What is happening now by this system, when you try to develop uh, strategies to measure time, to measure freedom, to make formats, etc., etc., at the end, I think, neoliberalism is eating itself because it needs a space outside of capital to guarantee capital. For example, just to say one uh, example, you need a, a law and you need a juridistic uh, um, institution who says this is property and this is a proper law, you can't act it. When uh, you also try to measure and make formats for a law system, you, ca you get corruption and also the market will fail. That's what I talked about, this negative feedback on the market. And it can grow and grow and then it collapses, it collapses. So I think neoliberalism will be its own grave digger. Mm. Uh, but before it happens here in Poland, we are trying to, to build institutions similar to, to, to these ones in Western countries. For example, uh, art market. Mm -hmm. We are trying to, to build art market. Yeah. We are trying to, to, to Im increase, to improve uh, private galleries, mm -hmm. selling modern art. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have succeeded in it. I don't know if, how much you are keen on situation in Poland. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm, uh, do you approve this, uh, this efforts, our Polish efforts, to build real capitalistic uh, art market? Uh, I, I think uh, from the position of heterogeneity, I think it is good to have both systems. So have a kind of, of uh, market space, etc. You, uh, you need all those four, what I mentioned in the scheme, sorry for. Uh, but this is very important, I think. So you also need a market, but they, they have to be in balance in a way between the, the state system and uh, the market system. So what happens nowadays, I think, is that the state is, um, uh, is wanting to get rid of responsibilities and is using the market for this. But that is a wrong uh, uh, transformation, I think. Ah. Thank you very much. It's going to be a cut. Do you want some milk? Or? Uh, no, it's okay. No, no, even not sure. Uh, so, so, so this is this is occasion to take up um, uh, this, this subject of, 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 of artistic strike, which happened two days ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that artist uh, mm, actually uh, are in the situation, the position that they have to fight actually to survive economically. And uh, they mm -hmm. need also private galleries to support yeah. them, yeah. to act on the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is why I'm asking you. Mm, how much similar is the situation in, in post-communist countries? Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question to me. I don't. I uh, I have no totally idea of it. What I think, what I can comment on is is uh, 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 what is happening. A strike of artists is very interesting, and from my perspective, on from uh, the former West, <laughs> uh, because what I saw in in the past. Uh, it was very difficult for uh, artists in, in Belgium, for example, where I'm from, uh, to um, have their own uh, protection by unions. Uh, 
They talked with a lot of unions and not one union was interested in them because they said, the union said always, you have so, such a particular singular situation, we can't defend you. And uh, that's, the, that's the huge problem of unions, because unions have a classic way of uh, fighting on a collective level. Uh, when there are a lot of workers, they are strong, but they, they didn't react at all and didn't uh, develop strategies for post-Fordism, for individual workers, etc. etc. So we fought in Belgium for 10 years for what we called a law for the artists, a social law, which, uh, which uh, defends uh, his work and also when he has no less projects, etc. etc. So what I think is interesting when artists strike, that they make themselves visible as a collective uh, actor again. And this can be a very interesting uh, uh, thing at this moment. So, I think by, uh, how do you say, maybe it's a little bit, a bit stupid to say, but I think uh, the neoliberalization of uh, uh, and, and the problematic side of the liberalization, how it came into, especially in the Netherlands, the UK, etc., etc. In Poland, what I think and see, and by talking with people, it comes here in three years, mm -hmm. I, we, yeah, I, I think. But you can be prepared and, and, and use the, uh, uh, the experiences already for former Western countries to, to uh, develop strategies. And I think this is a very good one at this moment to get on strike as, as, as an artist. Because can, can an artist go on strike? He can think always, he can always be creative. So he has to find also what can be a strategy to go on strike as an artist. How do you define this? And this is a very interesting uh, negotiation. The artists go on strike, at least in Poland, but on the other hand, also in Poland, I think also in Poland, but definitely in, in, in Western countries, you mm. are writing about it in your books. We observe increasing uh, popularity of this profession. So, so young people definitely hope for some profits. It is. A, can you explain why it happened in the <laughs> last 20 years? Um, two things. I think, first of all, and this, this is the direct thing, in what we see in mass media are only the successful uh, artists or the scandals. When you, have, you get a picture of the, uh, the art world nowadays, there are scandals, the blood, uh, blood, sex, blasphemy, or it is about high prices on the art market and successful artists. So, you get a kind of uh, excessive uh, uh, mirror of what the art world could be as an artist, as a young artist. That's one thing. The second thing is, in or already from the 19th century on, the art world itself is promoting something what is very attractive nowadays, also in nowadays economy. This is authenticity, creativity, uh, being yourself, making yourself, etc. So the whole, let's call it uh, a little bit blunt, the whole ideology or the ethos of the art uh, system, how it is also again uh, presented, is a highly neoliberal uh, uh, conventional profile. It's very good for neoliberalism. And so uh, this is um, uh, taken over by, I think, and uh, is making also, made also attractive for, for young people. So, so is art a kind of a neoliberalism ideology? You know, <laughs> in the 19th century, we used to say laissez-faire, uh, get rich. Yeah. And in the uh, 21st century, they say, Get creative. <laughs> Get creative. Yeah, creative is really. Uh, I have, I've written now a small. It's uh, in the editing phase, but I'm finishing now a book uh, which is called Creativity and Other Fundamentalisms, <laughs> because it is really about. It is fundamentalism nowadays. You have to be creative. It is. It's moral law. Yeah. This yeah. creativity and also individuality, etc., etc., is promoted as a kind of myth. What we see, what the effect of there is, is that a lot of people want to have a free 
career or want to be free uh, uh, in general, define what uh, their own work will be and they, for example, also want to define uh, if they uh, do a job or not do a job. Uh, uh, so uh, are free in this, but in fact, this freedom makes them enormous individual independent of uh, all the, uh, uh, the the general context in your function. So it's a very double thing, and it it uh, it makes what I call uh, um, or it it uh, develops a kind of self precariority. You uh, precarious. You you make yourself. Uh, uh, a poor guy in the system because of you you want to do uh, define your own job but that means also uh, when you do this in a very indiv individual way nobody will support you so this this neoliberal system with uh, stress on creativity etc etc uh, gives a shine of attractivity uh, which gives people the feeling that it is good to be free and individual, etc. But at the other side, it makes it, uh, those individuals very precarious and very dependent uh, on it. But I think it is an illusion to be free. Uh, to uh, uh, on the individual level, I mean, I think you need the collective to be uh, uh, free on the individual level. Mm. Mm. Uh, what do you think about Richard Florida? Uh, what do, uh, Richard Florida? Uh, I think it is a kind, a kind of a counter a counter partner for you, a, a yeah. kind of a, kind of a someone against whom you are fighting. And I'm asking about Florida because he seems to be a kind of an intellectual f foundation for Polish government. Polish okay. government um, uh, proposed a kind of a strategy for the future, which is based actually on, on, on Florida's conceptions. Yeah. Uh, also in the Netherlands, every uh, city government has in their policy plan the Richard Florida somewhere. So it is not only in, in uh, Poland. And the interesting thing is also that every uh, city government, or maybe the Polish government, I don't know, thinks that they are unique by doing this. <laughs> so it, it, there you see already the ideology coming in. Okay, that's, that's one thing. Uh, second, I think uh, there is... Um, um, Richard Florida uh, at one side is too much popularized and is used selective because for example Richard Florida says very clear you uh, my uh, my uh, theory only works for huge metropoles so not for small cities of 500,000 people even not for 50, that's one thing so he is is used very selective and uh, policymakers use what they can can get from him so he's, he's misused also at the other side, I don't think, um, or the problem with what I have then with Richard Florida, the, uh, is that he doesn't let see, almost not, sometimes he, he has small remark in his books, but he doesn't let see the other side of, of uh, these creative industries and, and, and these uh, creative cities, etc. And the other side is um, 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 a precarious situation and, and uh, people who get poor. I know uh, people who are in prime time almost every day on television on, in Italy and earn 800 euros uh, a month. So this is the situation of uh, creativity. So it is a kind of bubble this this uh, creative thing and uh, I said also in my lecture for example in Germany it comes at, at the third uh, phase now in, in, uh, in the level after the car industry and, and the chemical industry but when you ask people as, uh, how uh, is it um, what is the status of the unions for example in the car uh, industry and you compare it with the creative industry you get of course a totally other picture so this this economy uh, is working um, uh, standing on um, how do you call it um, I'm searching for the word it's starting on on a uh, very weak sand it is really uh, 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 w which is uh, yeah okay <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much thank you very much